Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to, to you by the IDEAS Pro Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project, ECP, of the United States Department of Energy. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley uh, Lab, and I will be the host for today's webinar, Taking Hack into the Exascale Era, New Code Capabilities and Challenges. Uh, the webinar will be presented by Stephen uh, Rangel. He's a member of the HACK development team. Uh, he joined the Computational Science uh, CPS division at Argonne National Laboratory as an assistant computational science scientist in 2021. And prior to that, he was a postdoctoral, uh, uh, also at the postdoc at Argonne as well, uh, and, uh, working on porting HACK's uh, hydrodynamic solvers to the Aurora um, supercomputer. He began contribute to the hack a while back while he was still a PhD uh, uh, at Northwestern University, uh, where he worked on the design and implementation of a scalable analysis software for anybody cosmological simulations. Uh, Steve will, uh, Stephen will receive questions through the Zoom chat and also Google Doc. I'll paste those addresses to the chat momentarily. Uh, I think we'll have breaks during uh, his presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. And with that, I'll stop my sharing here and take over, please. Seven. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see, give me a second to to start my screen sharing. Okay. Um, uh, I hope you, everybody can see my slides now. Um, yeah. So my name is Sonia Hell, and uh, I work on the the hack code uh, as a computational scientist at, at Argonne. Um, so, uh, sort of what, it, what is hack? So hack is a hardware accelerated cosmology code. Uh, and why do we run hack? Uh, well, one reason is to further theoretical research and cosmology, uh, to help understand large scale structure of the universe, uh, look for a science of new and interesting physics. Um, and, and an important thing is to be able to compare with observations. Uh, so astronomical surveys, for example, like performed by LSST. Um, an important part of that is to be able to create uh, mock universes for, for helping survey design. Um, and this helps provide theoretical models for uh, summary statistics for data analysis. Uh, so emulators are, are work that comes, um, that, that comes out of some of the uh, cosmological simulations. Um, and understanding data covariance parameters for estimation. Uh, and just you know, so because, you know, we have one single universe, uh, that means uh, to be able to explore theory, we have to do forward modeling and the simulations um, are, are doing uh, the, the necessary forward modeling. So um, in this figure, we see the evolution of dark matter. So uh, dark matter, um, as the universe expands, uh, structure condenses and uh, from a very smooth initial conditions. So uh, in this panel on the on the left up upper left, uh, we see this sort of very uniform smooth initial conditions. And as uh, the simulation evolves, uh, we start to seeing this uh, structure condensing, so clumping together of of the dark matter. And you start to see these uh, cosmic web uh, as it's known. Uh, structures start forming these filaments and and these um, these pockets of of uh, of dense structures. So dark matter is a dominant mass component, um, and it's modeled uh, effectively as a collisionless fluid. Um, so perhaps uh, the most fundamental structure we identify in simulations are something called halos. Uh, so these these uh, collections of particles, uh, dark matter particles, um, form these overdense regions, and and halos provide these deep gravitational wells where baryonic matter uh, can collect, uh, cool, condense, and eventually form the stars and galaxies uh, that we see when we um, point our telescopes into the sky. Um, so roughly half of the the mass in the in the universe end, ends up in these dark matter halos. Uh, by by our current epoch, so as by by the time the universe gets to where we are now, um, and halos are are identified in simulations by looking for these coherent structures, uh, roughly about a hundred times the background density, and we use in simulations we use um, 
we use uh, algorithms um, like the like DB scan uh, to be able to find these collections of particles. Um, so uh, another thing that is very important. Um, so halos form in a in a process uh, in a hierarchical hierarchical formation process. So another bit of interesting analysis that happens inside the simulation uh, is is tracking the evolution of these structures. Um, so we want to understand how uh, this colliding and merging happens, and we want to keep track of that. And that interaction history of halos is important because interactions between galaxies um, within halos can trigger epochs of star formation, um, and the total history of star formation um, can determine, uh, for example, like the luminosity and colors of galaxies. Um, and these interaction histories of halos uh, are, are summarized in this in this figure. And um, so this is what we would call the, a merger tree. Um, we we also do some something called core tracking. Uh, and here, the, the very inner part of a halo, that's a, a very tightly bound um, set of core particles um, that, that's not easily disrupted, um, is being tracked as these uh, mergers are occurring, right? So during this hierarchical formation process, um, we're identifying these cores and we're tracking them um, as as a as as the core of a halo merges uh, with another halo. And uh, what we're seeing um, on, on this figure on the right is uh, the trajectory of all of the cores that eventually became one big massive object. Um, and each one of those lines represents the trajectory of a, of a set of core particles uh, that was at one point a, an isolated individual halo. So this gives you sort of a picture of the kind of dynamical interactions that are happening between these overdense regions of particles and how they come together to form even more massive and even more massive uh, halos as the uh, as uh, simulation evolves over time. And we use these core positions uh, for, sev for several things, but uh, an important, um, important reason to track them is uh, they're likely good proxies for, for galaxy locations. So um, if when we're doing some kind of uh, modeling of, of galaxies um, and one and was uh, interested in, in their distribution and placement, um, these, these core particles are, are good proxies for that. Um, I think to note too is another bit of analysis or transformation really that that happens in the simulation is uh, these predictions of light cones. So in, in body simulations operate in a in a co-moving gauge or in a in a co-moving coordinate system, um, but observations are not made in that in that same gauge. So uh, because the speed of light is is finite, um, we observe objects as as they were when when the light from those objects. Um, Left them and and are now uh, are being collected as as we see them now. Um, so these the effect is you know when we look out into the sky we see objects as they were um, at, at at that time. So the farther away an ar an object is, the further back in time we see it. Um, so because hat runs in these fixed size boxes with co moving coordinates, um, we. Uh, we have to do some transformations to the data to make it look more like what observations uh, uh, ground or observations from telescopes would look like, um, and uh, and and this makes the 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 data from simulation uh, much more useful for uh, for comparing with observational data. We do a similar kind of thing um, with these halos and merger trees that I had just described to you. So if we want to look at uh, what a merger tree would look like, again, sort of in this uh, frame of, of looking at it as, as an observer would, um, taking into account the speed of light, um, then we do a little bit more processing. And, and that's what this figure demonstrates is how do we take something from uh, a merger tree uh, that's put together from a set of fixed uh, simulation snapshots and 
if and and place that on a light cone or how do we sort of how would we make those collections of objects that form the merger tree uh how would that look from the perspective of of an observer um and uh so so this is basically taking the merger tree information and and um, taking the the concept of a light cone and, and putting those two together um so very complex things happen in in the simulations uh, and I just want this is just a, a sort of a, a brief um, overview of the the kinds of rich analysis or the kind of rich data that comes out of the analysis um, from 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 the running and body simulations, cosmological and body simulations. Um, I, I'll pause real quick here just to see if there are any questions because I'm going to kind of change topics a little bit. Uh, no, I think you can continue. Thank you. Great. Um, so I, I want to kind of change topics just a little bit and, and talk about Hack in in, in the pre-exascale era. Um, so Hack was first designed uh, and run um, uh, in, at, at the very early petascale era. So um, its predecessor code was originally developed as this gravity-only cosmological and body structure formation code written at Los Alamos um, and was designed and run on the IBM Roadrunner supercomputer uh, that featured the, the IBM cell broadband engine. So from the very beginning, Hack was designed to work on a, in a computing model that uh, was uh, expecting to have a, an accelerator. So a, a, a compute uh, a computing model with accelerators in mind. Um, and to accomplish this, uh, a principal part of the design is, is this notion of force splitting, where the force of gravity is split into a long range component and a short range component. A long range component of gravity is calculated using this particle mesh method uh, that uses a distributed, uh, distributed memory for a transform based uh, Poisson solver implemented with MPI. So um, the the long range force is, is calculated um, basically using this, you know, this distributed memory FFT implementation. Um, and, and this is the part of the code that, that weak scales uh, very well. The short range component of gravity is calculated using this direct particle particle comparison, and it's implemented uh, with, with C intrinsics or whatever uh, programming model um uh accelerated uh, for the accelerator uh is, is available and for for the cell um this was uh, you know c c intrinsics but the uh, but the way to think about it is the short range force component of gravity uh takes advantage advantage of the accelerator um so just a sort of you know more fine grained picture of of what's happening with force splitting um, the, and, and the reason gravity really is difficult is because it's it's infinite and unshielded. So, in in a NIM body simulation running on a modern supercomputer, uh, the domain decomposition um, is is such that we have subvolumes of particles, but that means each particle is interacting with every other particle on every other rank in principle, uh, and or on every other part of the of the supercomputer. Um, so that makes it difficult, but the 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 separation of of, of scales for the forces um, is is really the the key to to getting uh, good scalability. Um, so to achieve this, the to to be able to incorporate or separate long range and short range, uh, we implement a technique of operator splitting. Um, so this is a kind of leapfrog integrator. Um, and we use uh, basically a, a symplectic integration scheme that uses a kickstream uh, combination. So either kickstream kick or stream kickstream. Um, but the 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 principle of of uh, symplectic integration is the the central component of this. And the the spectral force handover technology is really the important sort of engineering part of this, um, where 
being able to stitch together this long range force and short range force is something where uh, a, a lot of uh, sort of thought, thoughtful um, you know planning has to 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 go into this. Um, we use a low order cloud in cell CIC deposit scheme, and there's a spectral shaping that reduces noise um, to to do this stitching together. Uh, and the handover is, is extremely compact, so this is pretty important uh, uh, part of this. Uh, and, and basically three grid units uh, in length for the handover. So using this kind of design, uh, now that we have this, this force splitting technique, this allows hack, um, to, I just kind of alluded to, use a, a domain decomposition where the, the large volume of the simulation can be uh, partitioned into the smaller subvolumes. An important part of this domain decomposition is this concept of overloading between MPI ranks. So e each rank has a, a thin shell of particles uh, from its immediate neighbor. And this um, this helps cut down on the uh, amount of communication time uh, between adjacent MPI ranks. Uh, so no particles need to be exchanged during the subcycle. So the subcycling is, is for the short range force calculation. Um, and particles are are refreshed uh, or cached periodically. Um, and the, the figure on, uh, on on the right here uh, demonstrates sort of the the typical time step where we take a large uh, uh, PM step. Uh, so here we're solving we're using the spectral solver to solve between T1 and T2, but then we take a lot of smaller fine-grained time steps that are the subcycles for calculating the short range force and um, these are done uh, like I said you know using the accelerator um, so uh, so in preparing for for exascale uh, you know we we there's several challenges uh, so uh, one is just more that there, there's a, a large increase in the compute capabilities and more increase in the compute capabilities and in the available memory. So uh, if we just look at, say, Summit to Frontier, we see about eight times more flops uh, available um, on the systems, but maybe only about three times more memory. Um, and these X scale systems also have you know, multiple programming models, different kinds of accelerators, uh, different kinds of frameworks available. So just from a, a code development standpoint, uh, there are multiple of these programming models to choose from. Um, and the CPU analysis routines, especially on, on the host, uh, so I, so I you know, pointed to, you know, Hack is not only a, the, an M-body solver uh, for, with, for gravity, um, but also has a, a large amount of analysis routines. And these analysis routines uh, traditionally done on the host become a larger fraction of this overall execution time. So, um, so one thing is, you know, what what do we do with uh, uh, when we have a lot more flops, uh, but maybe you know not not as much available memory. Um, so we we turn to to add additional baryonic physics um, to the gravity only solver. So so uh, there's we developed this um, this version of hack we call CRK hack, where CRK is this. Um, conservative reproducing kernel formulation of smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, so it's engineered by, uh, developed by one of the, the HACK team members. Um, and it's a, a general uh, SPH reformulation um, that is, uh, has uh, more accurate error control. Um, and it resolves some of the discrepancies with the grid-based hydrodynamic schemes. Um, we can run non-radiative um, hydrodynamics, and we also have the ability to run subgrid models for radiative cooling, star formation, uh, supernovae, and, and uh, HN, so active galactic nuclei. So, um, so these are some of the new code capabilities that are being uh, that have been uh, put into Hack that are now can can exploit some of this additional flops available with uh, with exascale supercomputers. Um, we I, I'd like to just you mentioned some of the our software technology partners uh, in ECP and some of these collaborators have been uh, really important for us to work with. Uh, I'd first say you know, the ArborX team that have a very fast GPU accelerated geometric search library. Uh, this was really important for us to be able to accelerate some of the analysis routines. For example, using the 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 friends of friends Halo Finder. 
um, so that the halos that I, I pointed to earlier. Uh, and for the AGN center finding, important for subgrid models um, and a different kind of, of halo finding we do called the um, spherical over density halo finding. Um, so, so all of these were accelerated with um, with the Arbor X uh, library that's uh, that has a portable backend um, but is built on top of Cocos. Um, we also worked with uh, Veloce um, and SE projects um, to to implement low overhead checkpointing, low overhead checkpoint restart, um, and being able to do compression for some of our data analysis outputs. Uh, and these uh, so SE is a is a lossy comparison scheme. Uh, and where we can work to to uh, create errors that are they're bound and controlled and acceptable for the analysis that we're trying to perform. Uh, and we've worked with the, the Alpine team for visualization. So preparing for Aurora. Um, um, so the, the prime so in, in the in the exascale, so as as we've sort of entered exascale, you know, and we've had uh, systems like Promoter and, and Frontier, um, and finally Aurora, uh, the deployment has come, you know, on different schedules. And the primary and ongoing development of CRK Hack has has been using CUDA, uh, with with support for HIP sort of automatically happening in the code. I'll talk about it in just a second um, through macro transformations. Uh, and we chose Sickle to use um, as the the programming model for for programming Hack for Aurora. Um, so Hack supports multiple build implementations um, as it has historically, uh, and to to exploit the low level programming model features uh, and get the very best possible performance on on whatever target system that is. Um, and, and we have we've had a, a pretty long history of of doing this as as we've run on nearly every supercomputer um, since since Roadrunner, uh, target using whatever the best programming model is to to tune kernels for for those architectures. Um, so to to run on Aurora, we're we're using this semi automated uh, migration pipeline. This uh, to to transform CUDA to Sickle. And we start off with the CUDA kernels. We use uh, Intel's tool called Sickle-O-Matic. Uh, this is a, a migration tool that uh, has a, a lot of capabilities. We're using it in a simple way where we're migrating individual kernels um, at a time. And uh, we're using, in, in addition to sickle matic we developed our own tool uh, that is a Clang-based uh, libclang tooling tool uh, to do a functor transformation. So CUDA device kernels uh, are transformed by Cyclomatic into SQL device kernels. Uh, and these are SQL device functions. And we want to turn those functions into functor objects. And there's several benefits for, for doing that. But for us, uh, it, it's, it was a lot easier to to have a, a wrapper that can call, call both CUDA and Sickle in the same form uh, because that, that wrapper sort of relied on being able to call the function by name. Um, and it, uh, this purple box here kind of uh, shows the core code organization inside CRK Hack. Um, an important thing that we did, and the reason we need this functor tool is uh, we've written GPU API wrappers. So inside hack, inside uh, in, inside the, the the code base, uh, instead of calling something like uh, like CUDA memset, we'll call a, a sort of generic wrapper kernel or wrapper invocation that would say something like invoke GPU memset, and we would have uh, different build implementations for the CUDA version, Sickle version, and perhaps any other programming model that we want to support, um, making the whole site code a lot more agnostic to whatever the accelerator programming model is. Um, so in, in order to accomplish that, uh, an, an important piece of, of this whole process was uh, transforming our Sickle device functions into these Sickle functor objects. Um, Another important thing 
for supporting uh, rapid prototyping and, and development, especially uh, we've had a partnership with Intel, working with the Intel engineers, is developing a, a, a testing framework or a testing harness um, where using, um, using a lot of the same code that comes out of Hack, we can execute kernels, individual kernels, um, from the solver uh, on their own. So basically we can we can have an executable that can that's capable of of executing the the individual kernels from the solver. Uh, and the way that they, that works is that uh, we we run hack basically in in a mode where it can take snapshots uh, of the GPU data and save those for later use by the testing harness. And when we run this testing harness, we can um, load up those snapshots from taken anywhere during the simulation, run the kernel in isolation, um, and even test the the output of the kernel. So if the kernel was modified for performance reasons, uh, this testing harness allows us to even validate that the modifications made were correct or produced the correct result. So this was a very important um, very important tool that 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 was very useful in, in all of this optimization process. Um, I'd like to just show a, a quick movie of an adiabatic simulation, um, and this was developed uh, on the or the the code was run on on Sunspot, which is the Aurora Test and Development System uh, at Argon, and uh, this just shows you the the sort of the additional physics that's going on inside this um, these new capabilities that we've added to Hack. So what we're seeing on the left is the gas temperature and uh, gas temperature is going to increase inside these clumpy regions where there's more hydrodynamic physics involved, there's more hydrodynamic interactions uh, happening. Um, and on the right, we're seeing the the dark matter velocity magnitudes. Uh, so inside these tight regions, th these are the halos of the simulation. Uh, there's more, um, there's there's more uh, varial interaction. So so particles are moving around faster um, and interacting more and and generating more heat for these particles. Um, so so this is sort of a um, just a visualization of the the new physics that we've that we've been able to to integrate. I'll pause again quickly here just uh, for for more um, any more questions. There is one question here: um, Is the CUDA to SQL migration fully automatic with SQLmatic and the SQL functor Clang tool, or do you still need to go in and tweak individual functions by hand? So it, it is very very middle. So the answer is is no, but it is I would say ninety eight percent automatic. Uh, there's still some, there, there's a few corner, ca corner cases uh, that are, are correctly handled by Cyclomatic, but our functor tool uh, doesn't resolve automatically. Um, uh, temp template specialization, initialization is is one of those things. I mean, it's kind of an esoteric topic, I guess. But but so there there are some there are some particular transformations that we need to do. Uh, in in the in, in our stickle functor tool that that uh, are, are just I, maybe we just don't know the right uh, 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 lip clang tooling uh, AST type of syntax, um, but for the for the large large part, I would say about ninety eight percent. I would say yes. Okay, thank you. Continue, please. Um, so so now I just want to point out. Uh, uh, a paper that we recently uh, published. Um, so this is to appear in P3HPC workshop as part of SC23. Uh, so I just talked about, you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, additional physics and complexity that's going into Hack, um, and you know we're maintaining separate implementations of CUDA and HIP and and SQL, and uh, obviously you know this is a uh, uh, not not ideal, uh, but uh, prompted us to sort of start this uh, performance portability productivity study using SQL. Uh, so, so this work is, uh, like I mentioned, going to, to appear in, in the P3HPC workshop. Uh, and, and the rest of this talk is a kind of a preview of, 
of those results and and uh of course uh, i i join you to to uh uh, encourage you to to join us at p3hpc if you if you like the the material presented here because the the workshop is centered on all of these topics um so as an experimental setup uh we started off with a an adiabatic simulation to uh, of uh 512 cubed particles uh the two times there because we have dark matter and baryons uh, we're taking five time steps with four fixed subcycles. This is, this uses eight MPI ranks. Uh, we use four GPUs to do this. Uh, on Aurora, we had, there are six GPUs. We're using four of those just to maintain parity with all of the other systems. Uh, on Aurora, this means one rank per tile because each um, GPU has two tiles. On Polaris, we're using two ranks per GPU because the um, A100 that we used um, uh just it isn't in a in a tile structure um and uh we we know that that by doing so there's this results in about an 11 percent lower efficiency but just uh you know so we'll take that into account when we do our, our analysis and on frontier uh we're using one rank per gcd um and uh again this is one one node of frontier um and the systems are you know aurora aurora polaris and frontier and uh, where each of them you know, is a, a GPU accelerated system with different uh, computational capabilities on Aurora. This is the, the Intel Data Center Max GPU, uh, the A100 on Polaris, and the uh, on, on AMD, it's the MI250X. Um, so initial results, right? So um, because we have HIP versions, CUDA versions, and SQL versions, and SQL is a uh, portable programming language, uh, we want to be able to see how does our SQL implementation compare to to the native implementations um, on 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 the systems. So HIP on Frontier, uh, CUDA on Polaris, um, and the first thing in in our comparison uh, we notice is that fast mass optimizations weren't enabled by default on all the compilers, and uh, this you know manifested first by uh, seeing that the uh, the the implementation that we had in in Tickle seemed to be much faster than the native implementation. Um, I think the what we did on Polaris was we looked at the generated PTX, and the first thing that jumped out at us was the fact that uh, the math the the math functions were the approximate math functions, and we finally uh, sort of realized that the the fast math optimizations were were not enabled by default. So anyway. Um, Enabling though enabling fast math on on Frontier and Polaris then brought our times back to uh, much more comparable uh, timings with Sickle, which was was good. Um, it's actually beyond our expectation that Sickle would would perform uh, at near parity uh, with the same optimization settings on on these systems. Um, but our the first version, our directly ported version. Um, from from CUDA to Sickle on Aurora uh, was not was not very fast uh, or comparably not not as performant, and that prompted us to do a lot of uh, performance optimization. Um, and uh, I'll talk about those optimizations uh, in the in the coming couple of slides. So, uh, so what optimizations did we do to the GPU solver kernels? Um, and first thing we did was identify the hotspot kernels. Uh, these are geometry, corrections, extras, acceleration, energy. All of these are, are hydro kernels, uh, adiabatic hydro kernels uh, in, in CRK hack. Um, the important thing to, I, I guess, note is that the algorithmic implementation of all of these kernels is what we call a half warp algorithm. So the, the thing to take away here is that Particles need to interact with each other, and particles are are grouped into uh, are, are partitioned using a tree data structure. But uh, the leaves of the tree are these um, fat leaves that we call, where the the leaves contain some fixed number of particles within them. And then the code uh, we identify which part which leaves need to interact with each other, and the total amount of work then done by the by the accelerator is going to be doing all of these leaf pair interactions for all of the leaf inter leaf pair set that we identify. Uh, the way this looks 
on uh, on the GPU is uh, so either for a, a warp or a wavefront or a subgroup for for um, for the Intel architecture uh, is that we have some number of lanes and uh, half of those lanes are dedicated towards uh, loading particles from some leaf A uh, and half the lanes will interact uh, or will be loaded with particles from some leaf B. And then the idea is to do particle interactions uh, between lanes of the of the single um either warp or or uh yeah subgroup size or subgroup um on different architectures so um part of these optimization or one of the the largest that we focused on was uh, optimizing uh cross lane communication and here we're talking about uh, the the data sharing that needs to happen between lanes um and what we're seeing here is sort of one instance of this total, uh, you know, leaf A size cross leaf B size uh, divided by warp size. You know, if you, if you did this, you'd see that you'd need exactly this many instances. And the important part of this particular type of communication or constraint on it is that uh, this pair, there's a pairwise symmetry that's defined in the, these uh, equations for the hydro equations. Um, and it's so this is critically important for the correctness. And that by pairwise symmetry, I mean that if some lane I is interacting with some lane J, then at that same time, at that same instance, that lane, that same lane J needs to interact with the same uh, particle I. So you know, if, if we impose this pairwise symmetry constraint, uh, it's a particular kind of communication. Is that communication is captured by an XOR-based shuffle pattern, uh, and in in CUDA we uh, call this intrinsic the shuffle intrinsic, and the corresponding uh, group function on uh, on the Intel architecture using Sickle will be something like select from group. Um, here I did, I just, uh, on, on the left, I, I, this is a bit getting into the weeds, but, um, I'm showing assembly snippet for different select from group, uh, code generations that come under different circumstances, uh, how, depending on how this is used algorithmically. Um, but, uh, the thing to take away here is, uh, the, the top code snippet uses, uh, a type of register access called indirect register access, where special registers, these A registers, address registers, are used to reference parts of the register file. And this is a very slow, uh, this, is, this, this gets executed very slowly. Uh, one, um, one access per cycle, that what, what, what ends up happening. Um, and below is a, a more performant way of of uh, of doing um, of accessing data from the registers uh, called register regioning. Um, so, to explore sort of different communication strategies, we looked at using shared local memory, um, where this is a rather trivial thing to do, but where we we create a shared local memory available to the work group on the GPU. And all the data exchanges between lanes are basically going through a shared local mem dedicated memory for those exchanges. Um, with the with Intel or in our partners at uh, the Intel engineers um, coming through the 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 center for center of excellence um, at Argonne and Intel, uh, we we explored restructuring some of these loops basically so that the code generation would look like this more performant uh, code on the bottom. And then we also explored um, using these optimized instruction sequences. So basically writing inline assembly to do the, the exact uh, data exchanges that we wanted. Um, and I just wanna note that the for the broadcast version, this, this required pretty significant restructuring of the loops. So this breaks the notion of basically being able to use uh, cyclomatic because the transformation needed to do these broadcasts are, are almost rewriting the kernel or significantly restructuring the kernel. Uh, so this is, uh, so the question that, you know, addressing how, 
how much uh, comes uh, directly from cyclomatic. So uh, using these broadcast version, uh, not very much at all. <laughs> these are pretty much hand tuned. Um, so um, I, I just I, I'll quickly go over here for for time, but. Um, this is the, the basically the inline assembly version of, of what we did. Uh, so I, again, I, I showed you the the way this half warp algorithm works is half the particles are from one leaf, half are from another. Uh, after some staring at at the pattern, uh, we realized that uh, essentially if we could do these cyclic shifts on on half the warp size uh, or half the the subgroup size. Uh, we could achieve the same kind of communication pattern. Um, and this basically can efficiently be done with four move instructions um, of inline assembly, uh, exactly the way that looks in register space is, is something like this. Um, I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but if anybody's interested in this particular, so feel free to reach out. Um, so I, I just want to talk now just uh, some of the optimization results. Uh, so for the hotspot kernels, uh, so these are the, like I mentioned, the acceleration, energy, extras corrections, and geometry kernels. So on Aurora, on the on the Intel Max uh, GPU uh, Max, um, the most performant implementation was the the broadcast implementation. Uh, on almost all kernels, I think on some the the VI version uh, is is still very good. Um, and the the different, the bit largest difference is between the broadcast versions or in these extras and corrections kernels. And the difference here, the, re the reason why we're seeing this sort of this biggest difference is because the loop restructuring not only allows us to use these broadcasts with more efficient code generation, but also lets us reduce the total number of atomics, atomic instructions that are needed. And this extras and corrections kernels are very heavily used atomics. So as such, the 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 difference here is is more of a reflection of the the cost of atomics than than it is of of the uh the communication uh between lanes um on uh polaris and frontier uh the the results are almost quite the opposite the the broadcast version which was most performant on aurora uh, on the intel gpu is actually the least performant so looking at Polaris, looking at the A100, the broadcast version actually performed most poorly. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the broadcast version uses a lot of registers. The, the initial development of this half warp algorithm uh, was to reduce the number of registers needed. And um, and the, the this broadcast version uh, being very register heavy, uh, is is sacrificing performance here because uh, because of its excessive register usage. Um, the select from group version that that was sort of least performant. I didn't really point that out, but it was least performant on Aurora is now the most performant. Uh, and like I said, you know, and the the shuffle intrinsic and the select from group are are analogous uh, to each other. So the code generation for select from group is closer to at least from the communication standpoint closer to the the native hip and CUDA implementations um the memory uh versions of uh, the slm memory versions that were also pretty good on aurora um are also pretty good on frontier and not quite as good on polaris and the reason behind that is that uh the memory version uh the or the shared local memory and uh, the L1 cache on the A100 uh, share the same memory hierarchy on the GPU. So basically, the the more shared memory that we use, uh, the less L1 cache, uh, the less memory we have for in, in the L1 cache. So any any kernel like DUDT and and acceleration or the energy and acceleration kernels that are very register heavy and will have register spills uh, will be able to to least take advantage of the the L1 cache and the L1 cache is is important for for register spilling. Um, so now I just want to talk about the performance portability analysis. And so we have this metric for defining performance portability. Uh, so this PP metric, uh, where A is an application, P is a specific input, uh, and H is a set of platforms of interest, and 
uh, the efficiency is this um, is this metric on on A and P. Um, and important to note that the application efficiency is calculated relative to a hypothetical application that's able to use the best version of each kernel on every platform. Um, and so this application efficiency graph is uh, is looking at uh, it, it's a it's a cascade plot, and the cascade plot. Uh, the way to read this is that for each um, each one of these uh, lines on these plots on the on on the on the graph, uh, there's a different labeling. So so the cascade plot is always going to be monotonically decreasing in efficiency, uh, and and what's important to see is sort of the the rate of decrease. Um, so so we could see for for example, the sickle broadcast version, it was uh, most performant on Aurora. So give the label the first label is C. Uh, it was uh, less performant on Frontier and worst performant on Polaris, uh, indicated by the label ordering. And you could see the the steep drop off um, for sickle broadcast. Um, the most uh, per, the the most efficient. Um, and and what you see by sort of the, the flattest line is uh, our sickle uh, our, um, select plus VISA. And the and what this means here is we're using the select from group version uh, on Frontier and Polaris and the VISA version um, on Aurora. And here that has a, a uh, application efficiency in, in this cascade chart that is uh, the highest and most flat. Um, and if we want to look at the performance portability, uh, so this is this bar chart, um, performance portability on uh, uh, using this metric, the, the highest uh, performance portability was, this, was achieved by this select plus the ISA. Um, so, uh, now, now, a thing to note here is that performance portability doesn't incorporate uh, a productivity metric. So the the cost of maintaining the different code bases. Uh, this is so performance portability here uh, assumes that um, uh, or allows for without penalty different code paths. Uh, so different build configurations for the different target systems. So there there isn't a penalty for for having Code code paths that are wildly different from each other, um, and that's really captured with this productivity analysis. So with this metric of code divergence, so with code divergence, now we can look at uh, using this metric. Uh, we could look at how, how much code is how much divergence there is between the code base, um, where this uh, distance represents the distance between the, the source code uh, required to solve problem P using application A on platform site J. But this gives you, uh, this is kind of a, like a, a pairwise distance metric on the code base, on, on the differences in lines on the code base. Um, and this navigation chart shows us, uh, the way to, I guess the way to read this is, is um, we have performance portability in, in terms of application deficiency uh, on on the vertical axis, and then the code convergence on uh, on the horizontal axis. And the fact that all of these different implementations are near one on the on the vertical um, means that uh, for all of the implementations that we have, for all of the specializations that we did, they were very finely uh, very finely done. So there's out of thousands of lines of code that that make up all of the kernels, the differences between all of these specializations that we did for for improving the communication cost were at most. Uh, I think the the Viisa version is is at most two hundred lines of code. Uh, the shared local memory version is something like only twenty to thirty lines of code. Um, so all of the implementations that we have are are not very different from each other in the grand scheme of things. Um, what we have the this this sort of outlier that we have here, this unified uh, base is is assuming that uh, we're using CUDA that we have two variants of the code. So the, so CUDA for uh, for hip, um, sorry CUDA for for the A one hundred 
uh, on on um, Hilaris and Hip for for uh, Frontier and and Sickle for for Aurora, um, and and basically uh, the unified means we we have different code versions specific to all of those. Um, so that's why it's an outlier. But all of these are the SQL implementations, and that's why you see them all lined up um, with with minimal code divergence. Um, and uh, so, right, so here, uh, this select plus VISA it turns out to be you know, the highest uh, highest ranking uh, in, in this navigation chart, being that the the performance achieved uh, and the amount of divergence is you know, in a combined way, minimal. Um, uh, and that, that's that's the last slide I have here. I'll, I'll pause again just quickly for for uh, for questions. There is one here, um, Stephen. Uh, you mentioned the distributed FFTs only briefly. What size are they? And about uh, uh, and. Uh, and what about the, the uh, and about what fraction of the overall execution time do they take? Uh, so the the that part of the code is the part of the code that that almost perfectly weak scales. Um, and, and but the question about how how uh, how big do they go? I mean, well, on a large run, I mean that could be ten thousand or greater. Uh, uh, FFT size, right? So, so ten thousand cube, uh, or or even larger. Um, this really is is kind of a a, a parameter that we um, that we're that there's a function of of the of the simulations resolution and and overall volume, but um, it, it it in excess of ten thousand is not uncommon for for large scale runs. Um, how much as a fraction? of the overall execution time, uh, uh, again, is also uh, a function of sort of the resolution and, and particular configuration for, for the simulation that we have. Um, in, I mean, just kind of roughly ballpark number, I would say it's 20, less than 20%. Um, but you know, again, this kind of depends on exactly the, the resolution that we're, that we're aiming for. Um, and available memory and and you know how big we want to make the FFT itself. Okay, you have a final slide or, or? yes. Uh, so I just took some disclaimers for the numbers that I wanted to show. Uh, and conclusion. Um, so Hack introduced these new physics for into the simulation, um, made mostly because of the the uh, increase in computing power available now for exascale. Um, we described this process of maintaining you know, a CUDA code base and a single code base and how to migrate between them. Uh, we, we identified shuffles as being something that's, that wasn't performance portable uh, from NVIDIA GPUs to, to the Intel GPUs. We developed sort of very straightforward workaround. Uh, I think the shuffle implementation uh, with shared local memory is something that's is probably broadly uh, useful to, to many developers. Um, and we've demonstrated uh, through this practical potential for writing uh, performance portal applications with SQL uh, and uh, almost um, with a very high performance portability score, uh, near zero code divergence, um, and the pure SQL version is uh, is also very high, uh, 0.91. Um, so it's just some some key takeaways from from this whole um, you know, going to exascale. Um, Code outside of our solvers, so some of the in situ analysis uh, is is becoming a, a bottleneck or has had become a bottleneck, and sort of emphasize the need for us to GPU accelerate those. Uh, that this was some of the partnerships that, we, like I said, we did we done with Arbor X, um, where we're using performance portable GPU accelerated libraries to um, to to achieve that kind of uh, speed up needed with GPUs. Um, and also you know, get some, some portability and expertise from, from their team doing these kinds of geometric searches this is really important. Um, and you know, just overall, even from the, the core code capability of solvers, this increased code complexity makes maintaining multiple implementations more burdensome. And, and it really highlights the need for performance portable programming models 
um, and, and uh, the the SQL version of of Hack uh, we think is is an exciting proof of concept of of uh, having a single programming model that can be used across different GPU architectures um, with, without sacrificing performance uh, and and these kinds of uh, performance portable it, it programming models and and you know standardized programming models um, we're, we're uh, really strong advocates for so um, it, it, thank you thank you uh, you know for for inviting me and thank everybody for for attending and their time uh, and yeah any last questions uh, I'd like to take thank you Stefan uh, I'd like to um, invite the participants to unmute. Uh, uh, and uh, ask questions directly to Stefan, if any questions. Hey, uh, this is Miro from uh, Oak Ridge. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Sure. Yes. I have a question about the uh, FFT, actually. How yes. is your da data distributed across uh, the MPI ranks? Uh, are you using like a box layout or pencil layout? And once you do the for the input when you start the transformation and also at the end of the transformation as well. The, the input at the beginning of the transformation is a, a regular grid um, subvolume decomposition, but the FFT itself is is done using uh, the pencil layout. And the, the, fi the final configuration is still pencil. Uh, the well, after we perform the FFTs using pencil distributions and and FFTs, uh, the the one the FFT on the pencils and the final redistribution is back to grid. Back to grid. Yeah, I, we there there's several. I, I think we have we have a. The, if you're very interested in this, uh, there's a there's a standalone uh, ECP proxy app we have called Swift SWFFT. Um, and this encapsulates all of our FFT code into a, a standalone code you can download and try um, that I think uh, runs on most major systems. Thank you. And, and, and there's a, a lot of description as to how it, it works. Um, Thank you. Sure. Any further questions? If not, thank you again, Stefan. Thank you all for joining us today. Great, thank you.